thank you all very much. And I've been asked how I came to this particular topic. Of course, I, it had originally came as a, as a graduate paper about two years ago in our Concepts of Culture course, our Heritage Studies PhD program at Arkansas State University. And one thing I've been trying to do uh, with my doctoral program is to have been incorporating the study of politics into heritage and culture. And in Arkansas, I think we all realize if we, uh, even over just the contemporary period, our politics have been long tied to personalities. We like to talk about all the years that Arkansas has had the quote, one party system. Well, the renowned Southern political scientist, V.O. Key in his work, uh, Southern Politics in State and Nation, had a completely different view of it. They actually, he actually considered Arkansas to have had a no party system. In effect, it was a dominant party and a smaller party that existed primarily in name only, without much organization one way or the other. The large difference is one could collect the filing fees and the other one couldn't. And it would constantly be centered around dominant personalities that would be tied to very transient factions and local political networks. You could probably go all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century to the very loud, rogue, racist, however you want to put it, Jeff Davis, who in fact really didn't have much of any kind of political machine, but at the same time, held power longer than the average four-year governor by the strength of his personality and rhetoric. Well, we tended to, from that point on, Arkansans tended to embrace personality of tied politics and in various strains, of course, with Joe T. Robinson in his long service in the Senate, Bill Fulbright, uh, Orville Fallis, and then coming down to the 70s to who Diane Blair referred to as the Big Three, Dale Bumpers, David Pryor, and Bill Clinton. Again, large numbers of Arkansans gathered around the personalities that allowed these three men to build organizations that at least could, I could say, that, well, that allowed them to pass their programs, but yet they were more tied to the individual rather than the party. Again, the parties basically became vehicles for collecting filing fees and eventually paying for the cost of primaries. <clears throat> you really didn't have to worry so much about having organizations that could actually win an election against the other party until probably, let's say, beginning around 2010. So how do we remember how many personalities affected the voting habits of Arkansans. Well, <clears throat> we were blessed in Arkansas to have had a network of cartoonists who, yes, had opportunities to go syndicated and have the, the wealth and financial security that would have come from selling their work to large um, syndication networks like Scripps Howard or Gannett or the rest. But instead, they chose to focus on Arkansas and ultimately had a, in time, had a good financial remuneration from it. But, oftentimes,
sometimes the earliest cartoonists, both here and nationally, found that crusading and a checkbook didn't necessarily go hand in hand. Thomas Nass was one of the first. Of course, if we've got not our basic U.S. history course. We know about the big Tweed Ring in New York City. How many of us are familiar with the Tweed Ring? Hmm? Hey, great. And you know, Tweed Ring had you know, nice little creative ways of enriching oneself, like building a city hall in New York City, which is still used, by the way. <coughs> and the actual construction cost of building that city hall was something like $1.6 million. But somehow or another, a strange thing happened and it ended up costing the taxpayers about $103 million. Well, of course, went into the pocket of Boss Tweed of the Tammany Hall Democratic Machine and his cronies. Well, old Nash <coughs> was beginning to bother the Tweed ring with his cartoons that illustrated the corruption of the Tweed ring, especially the very famous caricature of Tweed standing with his hands in his pocket in a Brooks Brothers suit with a diamond gold tie pin and his head in the, in the form of a bag of money. So this starts to bother Mr. Tweed and starts wanting to get to the newspaper. Stop the presses. My, I don't worry about what the papers print about me. My constituents can't read, but they can see pictures. So, an emissary from the Tweed Ring offered Nash a half million dollar bribe to just go away, go on to Europe, and go to art school. Now, I did a little search as to exactly how much that $500,000 in 1873 would have been worth if old boss Tweed had decided to bribe him in 2016. Well, that bribe today would be worth in the neighborhood of $19.5 million. <coughs> now, how many of us would be very hard pressed to turn down that chunk of change? Mm, let's, let's just think about that. So, needless to say, Nash decided to um, be a crusader until, my lord, children, they get older. They have needs like roof over your head and food on the table. We buy we even want to send them to college. So after he helped succeed in putting old boss Tweed in prison, he in fact began to draw cartoons for commercial advertisers, which was beginning to become a very popular at that time. Uh, he would publish books of his work and even started to draw on contract for the Republican National Committee. So he found out that even the most zealous crusaders, you still had to have clients and you still had to have an income. Even the most zealous crusaders for honesty do like these suffer. <clears throat> even more pronounced in Arkansas. Most of your newspapers, editorial pages, particularly around the turn of the century, they used cartoons who were syndicated from the bigger networks. Watch my time also. Um, those cartoonists that were featured in Arkansas newspapers prior, let's say, to World War II, they either had outside business or some kind of employer or like Bill Graham at the Arkansas Gazette, he had other duties with the paper other than just his cartooning. He could go out and do a local news story or um, help write editorials with the editorial board. Sometimes we even sell advertising. <coughs> but. 
by 1941, this began to gradually change because the first cartoonists were hired by the Gazette and the Democrat on a full-time basis, even though the war, to an extent, would even disrupt that. The new breed, John Kennedy. And, of course, we had Mr. Kennedy until relatively recently. Um, first joined the Democrat in 1941, not long after that, he was drafted into the Army. Came out of Missouri, um, would draw for his regimental newspaper, would be mustered out of the service after serving in Europe in 1945. And uh, it's, uh, for a time, he would go to Chicago and would um, start trying to do the syndicated gig with the Chicago Sun-Times. He missed Arkansas. And by the late 40s, he was back working for August Engel at the Democrat. <laughs> About the same time, uh, Bill Graham, another transplant from Ohio, came to the Gazette. And, he, and Graham, of course, I just mentioned, was um, kind of the multi, multitasker in order to have a full-time salary with Mr. Highschool's paper. But then George Fisher broke the mold. I mean, who can, if you talk about editorial cartooning in Arkansas, you cannot avoid the immortal Mr. Fisher. Uh, came to be from BB, uh, brought home a war bride from Europe, which school kids of my age, Back in the 70s, that would be part of our, not just our journalism class, but we even had a American history teacher who our, at least once a week, our first assignment every morning was to work with the Gazette and look for Snooky. Look for Snooky. That's right. In fact, um, on the announcement for this, um, for this lecture, the um, photos of uh, the former governors holding up the <coughs> holding up the pillars of the old state house with Bill Clinton on the tricycle, had a friend that had noticed that and sent me a message, hey, I'm not finding Snooky here. <laughs> well, I kind of thought, well, I, I think for the special caricatures, I don't think um, Fisher did include the Snooky in those. And these, I think those were some of the last, the latest caricatures of Arkansas governors that, uh, that Fisher did before he passed away. Okay. But, of course, Fisher would, in fact, start as, well, he did the Thomas Nash thing in West Memphis with the West Memphis News fighting against West, the West Memphis machine and, like Thomas Nash, probably almost starved to death doing it. But, wait a minute. Okay. So... When cartoonists began to look for outside income, were they truly selling out? Well, the thing is, when media saturation began to really hit, when we started actually investing money in the, in the domestic economy after World War II, which that includes media, media is a business, as we all know, cartoonists like Fisher and Kennedy became an influential but limited breed. Well, why is that so? Because they were only one of about a dozen political cartoonist out of about 300 nationally that kept their focus on state and local issues. Both of these guys had tons of opportunity to make money on a national scale. And Fisher was indeed tempted, but T Fisher at the same time, he said, thought, philosophically, he had no desire to go national. He loved Arkansas, loved the Arkansas scene, and wanted to make a difference here. And of course he did. <coughs> so what was their unique advantages? They had a unique effectiveness within their home market. They didn't have syndication obligations, number one. Fisher even did not have the obligation until the early 70s of having to answer to an editorial board because 
he had his own syndication agreement with the Gazette and probably about two dozen or more newspapers throughout the state. If, if, if there was any corporate entity he ever answered to up to that time, it was Southwestern Bell. Because remember the old, if you ever remember the old Southwestern Bell phone directories and the nice sketch art you used to find on the front or photography or so forth? Think Fisher. And of course, John Kennedy, he answered strictly to August Engel at the Democrat, and it was do no offense, do no harm, maintain circulation and advertising. <coughs> the politicians, especially with cartoonists like Kennedy and Fisher looking for income, they saw the possibilities of cartooning, particularly here in Arkansas, because we were so late to go to a broadcast media market. Um, this was a particular way to reach a longer, wider audience because people even out in the rural hinterlands of the state, and I'm, again, even in the 1960s, early 1970s, down in my little corner of what you know is often called LA, that's Lower Arkansas to others, it didn't matter where it was a country store or in town or <coughs> excuse me, or on your front porch. People in my hometown, other than reading the local stuff in the Hope Star, which would have taken about 10 minutes, uh, we read the Gazette. Whenever you found a Hope Star box, you found that blue Gazette box. So, politicians saw the reach of the newspapers and thus saw the cartoon as a simple way to reach a wide market. So they discovered, editorial cartoons discovered the use of the comic in the interest of commercial clientels could provide them with some needed economic security and particularly Fisher did it well through his own commercial art service that he created, that he and Rosemary uh, created in the late 50s. Fisher Art Service, whose major <coughs> client was Southwestern Bell, and then later on, Winthrop Rockefeller. Now others branched into some commercial media adventures that gave them the opportunity to do political commentary by different venues, particularly I don't, I, I'm not even going to date anybody in this room. I've just met most of you. I'm not going to get in that kind of trouble. But um, back in the late 50s, um, well, late, well, mid to late 50s, George and Rosemary Fisher had actually branched into television. I, I was not even aware of this until I started pulling some uh, stuff off the uh, digital collections at the Butler Center. And George and Rosemary Fisher had actually caught one of the first children's Saturday shows on television in Arkansas on Channel 7. And down in my part of the country, before we got cable, we couldn't even get Little Rock television, so I wasn't even aware of this. Our, ours was out of Shreveport. It was our Saturday morning was Bob and his buddies, which who with Bob Griffin, who was the sports caster out of Shreveport, had a children's show. Well, in Little Rock, before Bozo and Gary Weir, you had George and Rosemary Fisher and Fido. Fido and his friends. Now, look at the pattern in which Fisher would draw Fido. Think further. How many of us really consider ourselves as fans? were and still are fans and connoisseurs of all the characters, both real and in props, that George Fisher produced back, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. How, how many of us can, okay, so, pardon? 
I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay, sorry. So, somebody tell me what was the significance of the coon dog? For fishing. Well, the old guard rest home, that's true. Thank you. That's one. Predating the rest home, though, in probably 77 and on, onward. Of the prior step, the tuna that David David Pryor's coon dog plan, that's right. David Pryor's coon dog plan. And you'll find it uncanny. <coughs> David Pryor, I mean, I'm sorry, Fisher, <coughs> I felt like really focused and got a kick out of Pryor's statement when he presented his so-called Arkansas plan to the 77 legislature, which <coughs> if you're not aware of it, was basically a home rule plan. He wanted to transfer certain responsibilities back to, back to city and county governments, <coughs> pass a 25% income tax cut, and then allow the counties to pass like a local sales tax or income tax or whatever. It was basically something, it was basically a plan like Ronald Reagan had tried to pass in California a few years before. Didn't, it didn't fly there either. <clears throat> but when Pryor presented it to the legislature, he, brought, he tried to present it in simple terms down to the point where the localities can do whatever they want with the money they raise, even if they wanted to buy a new shotgun or a coon dog. So the coon dog, <coughs> like the banana with Frank White and the tricycle with Bill Clinton, the coon dog would be Pryor's forever. And again, look at the coon dog and back to Fido. And then, as you mentioned, the, the coon dog on the front porch of the old guard rest home. So this kind of thing becomes a problem. But yet there was a model. Way back around 1928, it was an early series of comic type strips on the life and rise of Herbert Hoover. During the 1928 campaign, the old Horatio Alger story, he's, you know, he lifted himself by his bootstraps out of poverty. He was orphaned at age 10. Made himself a millionaire in, in the mining business. And it appealed to a large section of voters, especially those with limited reading skills. <clears throat> you can tell by the pictures that this guy was born poor, he worked his way up, and wow, this guy understands us. He should be president. And there, it was, in fact, they, what was the, there was a newspaper in Eureka Springs that was said to have done that series really heavily. It was, in fact, it basically was most heavily known up in the Republican-leading quadrant of Northwest Arkansas. Democratic National Committee picked up on that strategy for Harry Truman. And one of the first would be here in Arkansas would be one that would be produced for Sid McMath in 1948. There was a dispute over that, though, that um, McMath would claim for many years that the the illustrations in that particular comic book, you know, about the heroism of Sid McMath and you know the the fearlessness of Sid McMath, the reformer, prosecutor, and the like, claimed for many years that Fisher did those cartoons. Fisher swore them down. He didn't. I don't know if it was ever settled or not. I just think they just quit arguing about it. So. Kennedy's, he would start working for advertising agencies like Brooks Pollard, which of course Brooks Pollard was for Arkansas then what Cranford Johnson is now. But yet for Kennedy, had he been hard-edged like Fisher, he wouldn't have gotten those contracts because again, Brooks Pollard, 
For many years, guess which state politician was most closely tied to the Brooks Pollard Agency? Orville Fallis. And they also had close ties to Witt Stevens. <coughs> so, Kennedy's editorial and business emphasis was very much shaped by the Fallis era, particularly at Central High. The Democrat writers, for the most part, were friendly to Fawbus, so was August Engel. And August Engel understood that the success of his business uh, was very much predicated on, let's take care of the powers that be. Let's not offend. In fact, in fact, this was actually a quote from an interview I did with Rex Nelson on this particular topic. He worked very hard to build and keep circulation and did not want to upset the apple cart, and didn't. While the Gazette was losing money during that period, August Engel was making out like a bandit and so was John Kennedy. Uh, they just simply were not going to upset the apple cart by drawing cartoons that would upset, at that point in time, the King of Arkansas. Now, Kennedy would also first use, um, would, would first loan his services or contract it out to the Arkansas statesman. How many of us are considered, I mean, uh, are familiar with what the Arkansas statesman was? Arkansas statesman was, in fact, owned by Orville Falmus at that point in time but was actually the state newspaper of the state Democratic Party. I don't know what the Democratic Party calls their newspaper now. I don't even know if they publish one. Whereas Fisher would, when the 60s got around, would, would draw for the rival Arkansas Outlook, which would survive for several years after Winter Rockefeller. So Kennedy avoided controversy. In 1966, he was able to get within the Democratic um, establishment, which was splintered all over the place. Now, Orville Faubus was not running again. In the first primary, old Jim Johnson. And, of course, in the 66th primary, Johnson ran under the radar in the first primary. Nobody thought that he could forget in a runoff, much less lead it, that his suppose his brand of segregation and what in this particular case was considered to be Neanderthal attitudes towards federal aid for a small rural state like Arkansas was thought to be very backwards. <clears throat> of course, from his order blank, Kennedy would oblige to the Frank Holt campaign. And of course, we, if you remember anything about the 66 gubernatorial primary, Frank Holt was a you know, very respected Supreme Court justice. And of course, he was on the court like Johnson did. Johnson was also on the Supreme Court. And but managed to get the perception of being, quote, the Faubus machine candidate. And it's something that I don't think Holt was ever particularly comfortable with. But, Fisher, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Kennedy did what he was paid to do. Portray Johnson as this caveman Neanderthal who was again everything. Again, 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 again. Now, what a difference a runoff makes and the general election. Once the runoff was settled, Frank Holt was defeated. Justice Jim is the nominee. And in a flash, Kennedy is on Jim Johnson's payroll attacking Rockefeller as the supposed, I mean, the man's going to be a supposedly part-time governor, doesn't have his attention here, yada, 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 yada. 
And all of a sudden, <coughs> Justice Jim the Caveman becomes Justice Jim, the conscientious, hardworking, dedicated, responsible, open executive who will pay attention to the people of Arkansas. Okay? This is how you get the business when you don't make waves. Kennedy, as admired as the man was, nobody could ever accuse John Kennedy of making waves. He did. He drew wonderful cartoons, very humorous, but did not step on toes. Now, Fisher, of course, different story. Of course, he had some financial security that allowed him to do so with his contract with Southwestern Bell, did some contract work for Sid McMath, and in 1952, he would basically develop his message that he would, Fisher's message that he would use, or his style he would use through the 70s. A simple picture with no captions. Leave the, leave the reader to draw their own conclusions. And then he would only use them sparingly afterwards until you got to the old guard rest home. And then, of course, you had to have that dialogue. It was just so horrorously funny. But in 52, here is probably one of the earliest examples of Fisher's work with that particular um, um, with that particular strategy. And it would be done with or against the candidacy of Francis Cherry, who would challenge and defeat McMath in that year's primary. The old charges of a divorce bill being run out of Crittenden County. At that time, Cherry was chancery judge for that particular circuit, which <clears throat> which ran from Jonesboro all the way down to Helena. And of course, this would have been probably effective if it hadn't been for the fact that McMath himself was reeling from a very damaging highway department audit. And he was forced into a runoff. All the opposition got behind Cherry, and by that time it was a moot point. But Paul Van Dawson, the power of Perry County. The one time, you know, you had the big three of Bumpers, Pryor, and Clinton later. Back then, it was Fawless, Marlin, Mutt, and Paul. The powerful legislator from Perry County who had made a very unfortunate statement in a speech in 1964 claiming that we keep our women out of politics in Perry County by first giving them an extra garden to tend. Then if that doesn't work, we'll give them an extra cow to milk. And if that don't work, then we will keep them barefoot and pregnant. Well, the unfortunate thing was in 1966 that Perry County got redistricted with Pulaski County. Ooh, well, I wonder if there was a, um, purpose there. And Paul Van Dalsom got a real live opponent, a still Little Rock attorney named Herb Rule. And he was helped by a group that was backed by the American Association of University Women who first spread the word about his very, very not too smart remarks towards the women. And the group that backed her rule was called Barefoot Women for Rule. This was one of Fisher's syndicated cartoons. And of course, Van Dawson tried to walk all this back. He was no good at it. And the Barefoot Women had the momentum even down to the summertime when they were actually able to raise the money to a, for a large rally and picnic in War Memorial Park 
And again, you've got the image of the barefoot women who were going to, quote, rule over old Paul. And it worked. This was very successful. They, the barefoot women for rural contracted Fisher to do their advertising. <coughs> and Van Tossum, along with a lot of other Falmouth lieutenants, would lose in the Democratic primary by a margin of almost 2 1. He tried to atone later by sponsoring the Equal Rights Amendment in the legislature once he returned. And I don't think he was that well believed then either. But finally, the height of cartoonists producing for candidates, in which I have my prop here on the podium, from 1968 from a group called Democrats for Rockefeller that were moderate Democrats who would eventually end up in the camp of Dale Bumpers, David Pryor, and later on, who were not about to become Republicans, didn't feel like they had any reason to become Republicans, but would um, still thought Rockefeller was best for Arkansas, and it was certainly on a nonpartisan basis. Cranking up the old machine. Oh, how many of us are familiar with uh, Marion Crank? Seems like we are. I mean, one time Speaker of the House, he was again one of the big cogs of the Faubus machine, and was on the payroll for years of Witt Stevens until even Marion. I did find in my other research, which will be a book coming out later this year or early next concerning the 1990 gubernatorial primary, uh, which Marion would later, once control of our club and Foreman Cement would pass to from Witt Stevens to Sheffield Nelson, ultimately Marion would transfer his loyalty to Sheffield. So, from about after 1970 on, do cartoonists really need to sell out now? Well, Greenberg, Paul Greenberg, put this particular thesis out about 10 years ago. He thought a great cartoonist should offer more than just a quick laugh, a daily punchline, a sketch version of Jay Leno or David Letterman monologue. A great political cartoon, like a great editorial, ought to appeal to people's own standards, yet elevate those standards. Not an easy trick. And of course, when I had the chance to ask him about this quote when he came and spoke to us a few years ago at Arkansas Governor's School, I asked him if he particularly had, where Arkansas was concerned, I asked him if he particularly had George Fisher in mind, and even though he was with the opposing newspaper, or what had been the opposing newspaper, he said indeed he did have Fisher in mind, because when he was with the Pine Bluff commercial, he did have Fisher's cartoons that were syndicated under contract at the commercial along with several other newspapers. But many of these attributes fell to the advent of new media. I mean, in my little town of Hope, early 70s, we thought we had literally came to the big time. We got cable TV. I could actually watch Channel 7. And, of course, I find later in my research that that particular cable TV company would not have been possible without the uh, investment of someone who was key in transforming that same Arkansas media, and of course that would be Walter Hussman. And he still owns the whole cable company. Of course, the proliferation of television advertising brought this business collaboration of political cartoonists largely to an end by the early 1970s. Probably the last time I know of that one of the major cartoonists here in Arkansas contracted with a candidate he, in fact, the last ones Fisher did was in 1970, and I could not pull this up. I actually wanted to put it on this particular uh, presentation, but it showed a reporter at a Dale Bumpers rally having rushed to the telephone booth, calling into his editor, 
and at the back you say had a silhouette of bumpers speaking bumpers for governor unity harmony and big crowd and the reporter was uh, calling in and saying hey big scoop Goss he just came out from motherhood with all the complaints that bumpers never took a stand in that particular election but again that was another of the cartoons from this particular group um, Democrats for Rockefeller didn't work and that was pretty much by that time the end of collaborations of these cartoonists with political candidates because within a few years of course Fisher was on the full-time payroll of the Gazette but there still proved to be opportunities for cartoonists and newspapermen to use their talents in the new media and still benefit their bank books <clears throat> in the 1990s I, and I still remember this in Channel 11 Fisher and Bob McCord formerly from the North Little Rock Times and the, the, because the Democrat and then finally over to the uh, to the Times did their little joint editorial on like I mean this is the five o'clock report on Channel 11 in which McCord did his verbal commentary probably off of one of his newspaper columns and Fisher as he spoke drew the companion cartoon and I would certainly like to know and I'm intending to ask at some point in time if they still have any of those in Channel 11's archives I'm getting there okay so it was an exciting era only brought to an end by economics and the new media. Folks, thank you all for coming.